our series, The People God Uses. As we began this series, one of the things that I realized very quickly is that each character and person who has stepped on the stage, each character we've looked at, actually is living out or an example of the mission of our church. Our church desires for each one of us, whether it's somebody that's standing up on stage speaking, whether it's somebody who is sitting here in the house, whether it's somebody who attends our Shippensburg campus or somebody who attends our online campus, all of our goals is the same, and it's this, to find our next steps towards finding and following God. You know, we use that word next steps a whole lot. One of the things that I'm praying through this series is God reveal to me personally what my next step is. And that's what I'm praying for you as well. I realize that each of the people that we've looked at and each of the people who are speaking at one point or another have taken a significant next step in their life. You know, maybe at the time they didn't realize how important it was, but the reality is that they kind of leaned, in, leaned into what God was doing and they obeyed. And this is what I'm discovering and learning. That somehow when we take that next step that God wants us to take, he intersects with our lives and does something more incredible than we could ever imagine or think. And when I think about that, the question I have for you today is this, what next step is God asking you to take? You know, as you listen to today's speaker, I want you to kind of ponder that question and, and begin to hopefully develop an answer of what would God have me do in my journey? This morning, we have the privilege of having one of our elders, Andy Ziegler, speak with us this morning. And he's going to be sharing uh, from the Word of God, sharing from his testimony how God has used him. Now, there's a few things that you need to know about Andy. Andy is married to Christy, his better half. And he has three wonderful daughters, and I pity him for that. I have one girl, and it's all I could take to get through those years, but he's got three great daughters, and one of them is with him today, and so I'm sure she is the favorite one, at least today. So uh, he's here with her. Andy has, for years, has worked with our, and his wife Christy, have worked with our children's and our youth ministry. And one of the things I love about that is Andy has helped probably hundreds of kids take their next steps. And he's passionate about doing that. In fact, I would venture to say Andy may even call that his first calling, what he loves to do. Andy, in order to support that habit of helping teens, uh, also works for the Washington County Municipal uh, Authority, and he works there. And the thing that I love about Andy is, or one of the things that I love about Andy is he uses that as a platform to help others understand who God is and even answer some of the tough questions that they have. When we talk about people taking their next step, Andy is one of the few people that I know that truly take that to heart from the time that he came to know Christ as I've heard his testimony through these times. I've had the privilege of sitting under Andy's leadership as one of our elders, and he has taught me so much about God, about his word, and a love for his word. So would you please join me in welcoming Andy Ziegler to the stage this morning? As we get started, Andy, let me pray for you. Absolutely. And, uh, we'll, we'll get this started. Father, I thank you so much for Andy. I thank you for his friendship. I thank you for his leadership. I thank you for the example that he is to me of being willing to step out of your own comfort zone in order to take your next step and follow Christ. Lord, as he uh, shares with us this morning, I pray that you would give him boldness, courage, clarity of thought, that he would share uh, what we need to do and how we need to change our lives to match your word. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity this morning. And we ask it all in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Man, this is an intimidating service. Holy cow. They keep saying it's going to get easier, but I, I'm starting to think they're lying. Well, welcome to Grand Point. Um, as Chad said, my name's Andy, and uh, I'm the fill-in speaker this week. I've been watching a lot of other guest speakers, both in church services and out of church services. And there seems to be two things that they all do that I want to do so I can fit in as a, as a guest speaker. So number one, I've got to ask, how's everybody doing tonight? <laughs> okay, well, no matter how loud that comes back or how enthusiastic you are, I have to follow up with, come on, guys, we can do better than that. How's everybody doing tonight? Okay. Good. And every guest speaker is married to the most beautiful woman or the most handsome man in the world, which is really weird because I am married to the most beautiful lady on the planet. 
my wife Christy. She's unable to be here tonight. She's with my daughter at a lacrosse tournament in Delaware. So I don't even get bonus points for saying that. I'm just, I'm just up here speaking the truth. Christy and I have been attending here for about 13 years with our daughters. Um, and I am currently on the elder board, which aligns much more with my gifting and a whole lot more with my comfort. I'm much more comfortable behind the scenes praying for this church and congregation than I am up here speaking to it. But like Jason taught us last week, God isn't really interested in our comfort. And coincidentally, my word for the year 2021 is discomfort, which has lived up to itself immensely, kind of being a pinnacle right now. And I can't wait for 2022 so I can change that. I don't know what I was thinking when I picked that word. But as much as I enjoy being on the elder board and learning from all the wisdom in the room, my heart really is with the youth and the youth ministry we have here, the Point YM. Christy and I lead a Wednesday night circle. Um, this year we had the seniors, so we just celebrated them all graduating and moving on, and we're now gathering a bunch of freshmen that we will have for the next four years. It's always a bit of a shock going from the seniors back to the freshmen, but this is our third turnover, so we should be, we should be used to it by now. When Pastor Lawrence asked if I'd be interested in speaking during this series, I said no. I do have a pretty healthy phobia of public speaking. But he, was, he did a smart thing and said, you know, I don't want you to preach a sermon or don't think of it as a sermon. I want you to share your testimony and just tie it in with somebody in the Bible that you identify with and make it kind of a get to know an elder message. So I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm not preaching. I'm just sharing a story. That seems pretty easy, but there's going to be hundreds of people in here, so that's terrifying. And I've got my word of the year bouncing around in my head. And after some sleepless nights and a whole lot of prayer, you know, I agreed, and here we are. It, this is going to be different. Um, I'm just going to share two conversion stories, one of me and one of the guy I identify with most, Paul. Most of you guys know he was introduced to us as Saul and was a persecutor of the early church. So I'm going to give my man the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to try and see things through his eyes and try and understand what he might have thought was happening back then. So Luke introduces us to Saul in Acts chapter 7 with this line. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. I have a bad dad habit whenever we're watching a TV show or a movie and I know something's happening that will impact later. I'll say foreshadowing and my girls get all mad. They're like, spoilers. To me, this is Luke dropping a, a foreshadowing on us. He's in the middle of talking about uh, they're, they're stoning Stephen to death and he just drops this line in there in the middle of this execution. And a couple of verses later, he lets us know that Saul approved of their killing of him. So what's this guy's worldview, and how does God use him to expand his kingdom here on earth? Well, we're in the first century. We're in the Middle East. If you can picture the Mediterranean Sea, all the land surrounding the Mediterranean is occupied by the Romans. And on the east end of that empire, there's a movement growing. And it started with the Jews, who've now been scattered throughout the land for centuries. But no matter where they live or what language they speak, they maintain their identity as descendants of Abraham and worshipers of the one true God. So because of that, they periodically come back to Jerusalem for various celebrations and festivals. And during one of these, it was the Feast of Pentecost, they encountered a group of Jews who were able to communicate with everyone in their own language. And what they were talking about was this man named Jesus, and whom the Romans just crucified, and who they claimed had risen from the dead and was now ascended as the true king of Israel and of the whole world. And that this Jesus was now calling people to adopt his set of values and live under his rule, which he called the kingdom of God. So a lot of these visitors that came back, they stayed and they joined this movement. So it was growing in, in size and in influence and in favor with the people, but not with the Jewish temple leaders. They viewed it as a dangerous religious sect and even executed one of the early leaders of this movement, the aforementioned Stephen. So once that happened, Things got scary, and the followers of Jesus spread throughout Judea and Samaria, and it kind of looked like this movement was over. But really, this was just the catalyst to get it spreading. And uh, credit to where it's due. I got a lot of that from the Bible Project on YouTube, so uh, check them out. They do a great job. But why would Saul be against this movement? Well, let's take a real quick look through his eyes. He's a Pharisee. He's studied the law his entire life. He has learned under a famous, well-known rabbi named Gamaliel. He knows the scriptures. He knows the history of Israel. And much like we can go back and read the Old Testament and find out what happens every time the Jewish people turn their back on God. Catastrophe. 
catastrophe happens. And what might this look like to Saul, watching his, you know, brother, brother, Jew, uh, Jewish brothers and sisters give their lives to Jesus of Nazareth and start living under his commandments? It might look like catastrophe calming. It might look like the Jews once again turning their backs on God. So he becomes singularly focused. The complete destruction of this faith is his goal, and his zeal for that and for God is on display for all to see. And it's something that God will use later in his life. I didn't grow up in a church. I have some memories of being there when I was young. Uh, we were the C and E family, if you know what that is, the Christmas Eve and Easter, that's when we went. Um, I did go some throughout high school, but it was only to play basketball. I think we had to go two weeks a month, so that's what I did. And I went to some youth events, but it was only to hang out with friends and, and eat pizza and play games and, and that kind of stuff. All of the messages and lessons and teachings, they went in one ear and out the other, and I could not have cared less what they said. Um, I was about 14 or 15, and I thought, God's imaginary, right? I mean, this whole thing is made up. I can't see him or feel him or hear him. Like, why do we even need him? And uh, unlike Saul, who was very driven, very focused, I was not. I never really had a goal or a plan or a dream job I was chasing. I did okay in school, but I didn't want to go to college. So I, I thought that the structure of the military was, was something I needed in my life. So I signed up for the Army Reserves, and I went through all the testing and everything, and got to the point of leaving for boot camp, the date and time, and uh, I walked out of my recruiter's office the last time, and he looked at me and said, you're all set, you're all good, don't get in trouble. If I was doing my dad habit, I'd say foreshadowing, because I was a pretty rotten kid, I was a pretty rotten teen, I lied a lot, and I stole a lot, and I vandalized, and I was just a menace in our neighborhood, and I'd tell you guys some of those stories, but I want you to like me after this, after this so... I will share the big one. Um, a couple weeks after I turned 18, some friends and I broke into and robbed an electronics store, and we stole a bunch of stereo equipment. It was about a month later we got caught because the guys could not keep their mouth shut. Um, but as the adult, I, I had eight felony charges brought against me, which carried a fairly large jail sentence and a fairly large fine. And it was advised to me to do something to make it look like I was trying to do something with my life. Because the military was out, they wouldn't take me with those charges. So I enrolled at Monalto and started taking classes. And it was about 10 or 11 months later, uh, my case went to court and I got sentenced with community service and fines and restitution, but no jail time. So that was kind of a win in my book, but I wish I could stand up here and say that that was my turning point, or that's what opened my eyes, but it didn't. I lived every day for whatever would make me the happiest. Whatever would bring me the most pleasure, that's kind of what I chased. And whether it was drinking or drugs or girls or, or partying, to keep it PG for the little people in here, that's what I chased um, every day. And I was doing a lot of partying, and that coupled with the fact that I didn't want to be there. I dropped out of school to make the next five and a half years go quick. I moved to California with a friend who wanted to be an actor. Uh, a job hopped a bit out there, but it's super expensive. So I came back and worked full time and hated what I was doing. I thought, I need to do something that I'm at least partially interested in if this is going to be a job. So I went to Shippensburg, got my environmental science degree, graduated, moved back to California because that's where the environmental jobs are. Um, job hopped a bit, took a position in Vegas, which I had really high hopes for. I was really interested in it. I hated it. Um, working in the desert at 2 in the afternoon takes a special person, and I'm not that special person. So I, went, I moved back to California and got a position I really did like, I, with a company I really liked. Um, it was October of 2000. I came back for a long weekend to hang out with some friends, and I met a girl. And this is my last foreshadowing, I, I promise. So, after Stephen was murdered, um, Paul became emboldened. He's going door to door ripping Jesus followers from their house, throwing them in prison. He gets permission to go to Damascus to continue hunting them up there. And it's on the way his life changes. Many of you know this story. It's highlighted in Acts 9. He's walking along or on a donkey, as some people say, but it's not in there. Um, and a bright light appears. And a voice calls down to him and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And the voice says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And after this conversation, he's instructed to go into the city, and then he'd be told what to do. So he gets up, and he's blind. His friends are leading him by hand into the city. And in the meantime, God is communicating through visions with a man named Ananias. 
And he says, Ananias, you need to go here and meet this guy, Saul. And Ananias says, no, thank you, because I know who Saul is, and I know what Saul's been doing. And God says, you need to go because he is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles and their kings. This Pharisee, strict abider of the Jewish law, persecutor of Jesus followers is God's chosen method to take the gospel to the non-Jews. If anyone, anybody thinks that they've done something in their past that excludes them from God's service, you need to remember this story. This whole series, the people God uses, could kind of be boiled down to the people God chooses, and he will choose whomever he wishes. We need to be prepared and ready and willing to make that call if we get the call. So Ananias listens and goes to Saul, and he says, you know, I've been sent by God so that you could see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Luke says that something like scales fell from his eyes. And there are a couple different interpretations as to what that means. Some people take it very literally that the bright light on the road damaged Saul's eyes and caused them to scab up or scale up, at which point God would remove later, um, in this case, three days. And some people think it's figurative or literal, kind of highlighting the fact that Jesus constantly pounded the Pharisees for their spiritual blindness and they just couldn't understand or wouldn't understand. Well, now here's a Pharisee with a type of blindness who probably understands blindness a little better. And also when he recounts this story in Acts 22, Paul doesn't mention anything about scales or anything falling from his eyes, just that Ananias says to see, and he does. I do something with this verse that you should not do, and I'm going to make the pastors in here and Chad cringe a little bit. I put my own interpretation into it. Don't ever do that when you read the Bible. It's not the way we're supposed to read. But whether it's literal or figurative or metaphoric, to me, Luke is highlighting Saul's worldview change. And we talked about worldviews a little bit back in February. It's basically just the way you see the world and your place in it. And it's extremely important, especially nowadays, to understand when you're communicating with someone what their worldview is, to understand where that person is coming from. So... Luke's highlighting the fact that Saul sees the world, then he's blind, he's filled with the Holy Spirit and sees it differently. Not only is he physically able to see again, he's spiritually seeing for the first time. So after I met Christy, I went back to California and was working. We stayed in touch and wrote letters and made phone calls. Um, we didn't have Snapchat or Facebook Messenger back then, but we got close, we were getting close, we were getting long distance close. And in December of 2000, I had a decision to make about my position. And rather than stay there, I decided to come back and see if this relationship was going anywhere. So I came back and we went on our first date. And I have to throw a disclaimer in here because she does not consider this our first date. And if you ask her, she will say no. It was December 27th of 2000. I remember that because we went out to watch Mario Lemieux return to the Pittsburgh Penguins after a three-year retirement due to cancer issues and back issues, he's now part owner of the Penguins. He's playing for the Penguins. Um, it was awesome. The guy had a goal and two assists in his first game back. The Penguins beat the Maple Leafs that night five to nothing. I don't know how that team did not win the Stanley Cup, but they didn't. They were so loaded. Uh, the, the game went well, our date went well, and we started getting serious. We eventually did go on what she considers our first date. I jump ahead a little bit. I'm working as an air monitor for an asbestos abatement company. And one of our jobs is in Lewisburg prison. And my job is to make sure that none of the asbestos fibers that these guys are, are removing from places escapes their containment. So I have a lot of free time. So we go in a cell block and all the prisoners are moved out and they, all the, most of their possessions. But what's left behind are a bunch of magazines and books and Bibles, like dozens of Bibles. So I decided to pick one up, and I thought, you know, if, if we're going to be serious, if I'm going to, if this relationship is going anywhere, I need to understand her faith. I need to kind of know what she believes, because to me at this point, it was still ridiculous. So I picked the Bible up, and I started reading, page one, Genesis, here we go, and it didn't take long. I was like, what am I reading? What is this? Talking serpents and giants people living over 900 years, and we all speak different languages because of a tower built to the sky. What is this? Like, it, it seemed more like fairy tales and myths to me. And then I started just jumping around the Old Testament, which I, I definitely shouldn't have done, because I wasn't getting any of the story. It just all seemed whack. I had no idea what was going on. 
I was getting frustrated, but I think I knew that Jesus was in the New Testament. I'm not sure why I went to the New Testament. I think I, think I knew that. So I went there, Matthew 1, started reading. And we go through genealogies and the Christmas story and John the Baptist and Jesus being tempted and then chapter 5. Chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And it was the words and the teachings of Jesus that really struck me. And I thought, man, if we, if we could all live this way, the way this guy's talking, but I, I was living nothing even res- closely resembling what he was talking. But I thought if we could all live this way, what a better place it would be. So jumping ahead again, um, Christy and I got married April of 2003, and September 26, 2004, I repented of the life I was living and gave it to Jesus. After that, my worldview radically changed, and I struggled mightily. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to know all the who's and the what's and the where's and the why's of the Bible, and why is this book in the Bible, and why are these not, and why are there different Bibles, and why are there so many translations, and what does this parable mean, and what the heck is Revelation talking about? I wanted to know all this stuff. I was all over the place. Christy kept me as best she could grounded and focused on Jesus, but I was reading as much as I could and watching videos, and I'm asking questions of everyone. I'm emailing pastors and authors when I read something or hear something I don't know. It's kind of like a maniac just going through stuff. I'm also in chat rooms asking questions, Um, Christian chat rooms that I found. I was getting answers back that frustrated me then and they frustrate me now. Answers like, I got to have more faith, or we can't understand the ways of God, or it's not what's in your head, it's what's in your heart. And church, these may be good answers. These may even be right answers, but we can do better and we need to do better. We need to be prepared when someone comes to us with questions about our faith to answer them, to help them, to guide them, maybe where their next step. We can do better than the pat responses that we've been, kind of gotten accustomed to to giving. So I was reading along one time in Acts, and I absolutely believed that God was guiding my reading. I was in Acts 17. I had read this a couple times now. Acts is my favorite book. I'm in Acts 17, and there's a word that sticks out to me. It's called, it's, it's Epicureans. And I had read it before, it just never made anything, but this time it stuck out, and I was like, who are these guys? Paul's in Greece, he's preaching, and Epicureans come up to him and make fun of him. So I was like, who are, you know, why, who are they making fun of, and why? So I looked it up, they're followers of this philosopher named Epicurus, who lived about 300 BC, and I started reading about his life and his philosophies, but I also ran across an argument he had against an all-powerful, all-loving God who would allow evil to exist. And you may remember a couple months back, Pastor Lawrence had his signs up here. You know, I think God is great, God is good, evil exists. And he talked about them, and it, it, it's, call, it's called the problem of evil. And it's a massive stumbling block for a lot of people, um, skeptics and Christians. And it rears its head all the time. Once you start looking for it, you're going to see it all throughout the news and all throughout pop culture with questions like, why do bad things happen to good people? Where was God during our latest natural disaster? Why didn't he save those people? Why did God allow slavery? Why does God allow child trafficking? And this is the kind of thinking I never did as an atheist. My atheism was very superficial. I couldn't see God or hear God, so he didn't exist. This is deep, and these questions are tough, and they cut right to the nature of God. So I really got intrigued in this, and I was reading all of these arguments against God. As I was reading, I was also reading the rebuttals to all those arguments, and I was reading the answers to all those questions, a lot of the questions that I was having myself. And then my faith really started to strengthen, and I was at a place now where I could talk to strangers about my faith and and talk to my very close friends about my faith, friends that had known the old me who don't understand this new me. So after that, I was 100% in. I was able to start leading things here at church and, you know, get involved with the youth because I was able to actually talk about the faith I had just, just from that one word, that one time reading Acts 17. It's, it's, it's amazing. So if only Paul had written something post-conversion that we could talk about, you know, his thoughts, his ideas of what he, I'm, you know, Paul wrote tons. He wrote a third of the New Testament. I could have picked anything from Romans up to and including 
possibly Hebrews. And if I was doing a sermon sermon, I would have picked uh, Romans 1. It's one of my favorite chapters. I love the way Paul writes in it and his thinking in there. But since I'm sharing my testimony, I wanted it to be something more personal. So I was trying to remember back some verses or a passage that gave me comfort as I was coming into this faith. And I decided on 1 Timothy 15 and 16. I'm going to read 15 to 17, but uh, here's what Paul says. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I received mercy for this reason, so that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What a great way to end a prayer. But a couple things to take from these two verses. When Paul says um, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, this is kind of like Jesus's truly, truly statements in the book of John. When he says, truly, truly, I tell you. I think a The newer translations say very truly, but but same thing. It's kind of like getting down on your kid's eye level and looking them right in the eye and saying, listen to me, right? What these mean are, whatever comes out of my mouth next, you better hear. And what comes out of Paul's mouth next? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I have a really decent recollection of a lot of the stuff that I did and a lot of the stuff that I said and who I said them to and who I did them with, and they're embarrassing and they're shameful. But knowing that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient to cover all of that sin, and knowing that I couldn't do anything to add to it or to benefit myself, gave me a lot of comfort. And when I first came in, I took a lot of comfort, maybe selfishly in this as well, because it's not just me, it's all of you as well. And it's everyone online watching right now too. And it's everyone outside of this church, and it's everyone who's lived for the last 2,000 years. We all start at that same spot. So even though some people are further along in their walk, we all have that initial beginning where as a new guy into the faith, it just gave me comfort knowing that everyone I talked to about it had that same initial spot. And that was at least something we had in common. And then Paul writes that he is the worst of, the worst of us, the worst sinner. And this isn't a theological debate, ranking sin or sinners, like can we, should we? He wrote it, so we're going to take it at face value. But if he's the worst, this hero of the faith, God's chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles, then what's my excuse? If he's worse than me, and he's worse than you, what's our excuse? Shouldn't we be more willing, just like Paul, to share the gospel? Shouldn't we be more willing to defend our faith under attack, just like Paul? Shouldn't we be more willing to be prepared to answer the questions of those around us, just like Paul? He gives us really no excuse by claiming to be the worst sinner. He says he was saved so that Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience. When Christy and I were interviewing for the elder position, we met with Scott and uh, Pastor Lawrence, and I laid everything out. I wanted them to know all my background. I, you know, I just laid it out because I love this church, and I didn't want to tarnish any of the reputation. I didn't want anybody coming up to them and saying, you know, do you know who's on your elder board, or do you know what he's done? You know, I, I laid everything out, and they were both really awesome about saying, we don't care where you were, it's where you are now and where you're going that we're looking at, but I'm laying it all out, and Pastor Lawrence says, you know, this story keeps getting better and better, which, which is weird, because as I'm telling it, I'm like, ah, oh, this is getting worse and worse, but I think it has to do with what Paul's getting at here, and I am the father of three girls who've all given their life to Jesus, young, I've, between five and seven, and I'm very proud for them, and I'm very happy for them, And they take it seriously. They've all been baptized, and we talk about next steps, and we talk about what it means. But there is something about seeing someone who is living anti the gospel, who is living a life that contrasts what Jesus teaches, who who changes it, who turns their life around. You know, both of them are the same. Both, Both people are saved. But there's just something about seeing someone give their life to Jesus later in life that highlights Jesus' long-suffering love for us um, the way that Paul is talking about here. And finally, he says, it's as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. This has echoes of John 3 in it, right? Whomsoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And this is how Pastor Lawrence can stand up here and say, Christianity absolutely is an exclusive claim. 
but it is inclusive for everyone, for anyone who believes in him. There is one way to God the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ, but that way is open to everyone. There is nothing that we can do to earn it or deserve it. All the glory goes to the Holy Spirit for softening our hearts and opening our eyes. It goes to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, and it goes to the immense mercy and grace of, of God the Father who blesses it down upon us continuously. So what's my post-conversion life look like now? I too, like Paul, am writing to a bunch of churches, exhorting them and instructing them. I'm not doing any of that. I am working on loving my neighbor as myself. I'm working on praying without ceasing. I'm working on trying to understand everyone's worldview who I don't really agree with or who disagrees with me. In the past, I've used all kinds of pop culture, pop culture references to try and explain my worldview change. And I think recently I've come across my favorite. It's from the TV show called The Chosen. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Um, it's really well done. I really enjoy it. It will have you reading the Gospels differently, I promise, if you check it out. But there's a scene with Mary Magdalene and Nicodemus, and she has had her seven demons exercised. And Nicodemus thinks he did it, and she said, no, it was someone else. And he doesn't understand, and she doesn't understand, and they're trying to communicate, because it's a miracle, and neither of them know what's going on. And uh, she says, look, I, I don't know what happened, but here's what I know. And she says, I was one way, and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. It was Jesus. And what a great way to discuss a worldview change, a lifestyle change, while not taking any of the credit, but giving it all to Jesus. Mary met Jesus face to face, and then was completely different. Saul met the risen and glorified Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then was completely different. I met Jesus through the red words in my Bible, and then was completely different. Jesus will meet each and every one of us, whomever we are, wherever we are, whatever we're doing or whatever we've done. I don't know where you are on your walk to find or follow Jesus. We talk about next steps here all the time. I don't know what your next step is. But this goes out to kind of those, those people who are at the beginning, at the finding Jesus part. I encourage you to ask your questions and express your doubts and seek out answers. Find a pastor or an elder or someone who can help guide you on this journey. It's incredibly difficult. And it's almost impossible to do by yourself. My prayer for this congregation is the same that it's been for a while, is that each and every one of us would seek to meet Jesus, to know the abundant life that he offers, and the salvation that's found only in him. And that one day, we would all adopt his set of values and live under his rules, so that this whole world could be completely different. Let me just end in a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, our perfect, powerful, loving, creator God, maker of all things and giver of life, we praise you for yet another day we get to walk in your creation. Our prayer today is short, but it's not easy, Lord. We lift up those who may not know your love, who may not know the full life that you have made available to us. We pray that anyone searching for answers will receive them, and we pray that anyone with questions or doubts has them addressed. And we pray that those who have not fully committed their eternal soul to you will continue to seek and find fulfillment in a life with you, a life that is completely different. In your name we pray.